I was working and sitting in a bus in shots. A man came on the bus and told us that Britain had declared war on Germany. That was on September 3rd, 1939. Little did he know about war. Anyway, it couldn't be very long. We had a big army. I'd been allocated to the Royal Army Service Corps. At least I wasn't going to be in the front line as a target. I did not know much about war at the time, except what I'd seen on the newsreels at the cinema. When the day to leave arrived, Chrissy and Matt came to see me off. After saying our goodbyes, I got on the train. El Alamein was in northern Egypt uh, and it was a key point in the battle uh, in World War II because it prevented the Germans from getting to the Middle East. So in the Middle East was all the oil that they could use uh, to actually uh, give, provide energy for their armed forces and they were pushing to try to get into the Middle East. So then the British were waiting for a long period of time. They, uh, they got all of their supplies together and it turns out that at Al Alamein, the transportation and the logistics side of it was the key because they were able to store up all of the arms, all of the food, all of the products that they needed. And then when all of that was ready, then they were able to go and push against the Nazis in Egypt. Up until that point, the Allies were being defeated at almost every place. France had fallen, Poland had fallen, uh, uh, Northern Egypt or Northern Africa had fallen. Uh, they weren't doing very well on multiple other fronts, and so El Alamein was the first significant Allied victory of the war. At El Alamein, he was responsible for, uh, in the months leading up to the battle, where he transported from some of the ports in northern Egypt, transported the goods and services to El Alamein. Uh, so every day they were driving their trucks back and forth from the ports in Alexandria and in northern Egypt, and they were driving them to the front at El Alamein. I detested the army, and sometimes I opened my mouth and said things I shouldn't have. When I did this, I was punished with extra duties, such as washing the dishes for about 300 men, or peeling potatoes, cleaning up anything to keep busy. I soon learned to keep my mouth shut, at least when someone could hear me. After El Alamein, which would have been the, one of the first significant victories, from that point on, the Allies pushed all the way across North Africa uh, until they got to uh, what today is called Tunisia. And from there, they were able to launch the very first attacks into Sicily and then uh, on into Italy. So for the very first time, the Allies had made landfall in mainland Europe. So this allowed the Allies to open up two fronts against the Germans. So you had the Russians on the Eastern Front, and now you had the Allies on the Southern Front pushing northward. We could look across this great valley and could see what looked to be a cliff. We could hear shell fire and see dust rising and actually see figures. We were standing on the superstructure of our truck watching all this when we were attacked by a German fighter plane. I jumped and blacked out for a moment when I hit the ground. We were not hit, but a few trucks further back were hit. This is where Sergeant Holland was killed. He was like a father to us. John Baxter was involved in a number of invasions. So on the invasion of Sicily, the day that the invasion happened, he was driving trucks onto the beach. 
uh, the day that the invasion happened in Italy, the very day, by that afternoon, him and his crew were driving trucks and supplies onto the beach. When it came to D-Day, uh, it happened, it, it was the same thing. So on that day in June, he and the Royal Army Service Corp were driving the trucks up the beachhead. So they were going ashore on D-Day, getting as much supplies offloaded as they could to those soldiers. We sailed the next night, June 5th. We still could not land as there was a line of German concrete pillboxes and we were being machine gunned. We were still out to sea a bit and we could see where the firing was coming from. It was then we heard a noise that we had never heard before. It was a jet fighter. It came out from the coast and some of the Germans were getting out of this guy's road. He was not the only jet, but it was so fast and had lots more power than the German planes. It was at this point that a British Bren carrier, fitted with a flamethrower, came along the line of pillboxes sticking the nozzle of the flamethrower into each pillbox, and the German machine gunners came out running. They were on fire. They did not make it to the sea to put the flame out. They were mowed down. The ramp on the boat was dropped and we were driving off the boat up to the beach. When I met John Baxter in the mid-1990s, he uh, didn't talk about war in very glowing terms at all. He would talk about the horrible nature of war, and he would talk about the devastation that it caused, uh, not only in the landscape, not only to the cities that he passed through, but to the people themselves. And the one thing he always told me, he says that all of these movies that come out about war, there's one thing that they're never able to capture, and that's the smell of war. He says the smell of a battlefield is unlike anything you've ever smelled. Uh, the smell of the dead, the smell of the gunpowder, the smell of rotting corpses, the smell that's it's overwhelming. It's, it's all around you, and you can't escape it. We were almost at Namagen when the action started. Arnhem and Namagen was almost an island. The River Moss and the River Rhine went up each side of Arnhem. Well, the Germans were beaten. Here, after a lot of killing, we were on our way again and were well into Germany by this time when we received word the war was over. The Germans had surrendered. We were at a place called Omerbrach and were told we were going home. Um, John never talked about his experiences when he was in uh, back in Scotland, which was his home. He never discussed it with anybody. He never even told his wife what had happened. He never wrote anything down. He had a box full of medals that he had won, and those were just in a uh, in a box, in a shoe box, and in a drawer. And they were forgotten. They were never pulled out, and war was never discussed. The stories were never talked about. His grandchildren were asking him questions about the war. They were asking about what he did. His family wanted to know what he did. And even though he ignored all of his medals, his family took great pride in what he had done. And so he began to write and he wrote those things down. In the mid-90s, in 1995 and 96, I spent a lot of time with him and he gave me a copy of these memoirs. We talked about it, his wife talked about it. And we found that when you discuss things, uh, it's easier to, to process it, it's easier to handle it, it's easier to deal with it.